Oh, excuse me, I had to unmute there for a second. Good morning, this is Tuesday, December 14, our class session, Math 261 at Delta College. This is our final exam week. We just call it exam three. We broke the course up into three sections and each section, each exam you've taken just dealt with that section. This week, you're working on exam three. Exam three, remember, was released on Saturday, December 11, and it's due by 11.59 p.m. on Saturday, December 18. I have to turn around the grades relatively quickly, so make sure you have that in on time, as you usually do. Uh, you also have a homework from section 6-8. Two problems that's due tonight. Some of you have handed that in already. When you hand that in, I'm going to grade it immediately and record it. I won't release the solutions or the graded papers until after midnight tonight when it's due. But if you hand that in, you can start working on your exam in earnest. So there's no pressure. You can have the ordinary deadline. which is Tuesday, December 14. But when you hand that in, I'll turn it around as quickly as possible tonight <coughs> and post solutions in case you'd like to review solutions related to your exam. We've covered all the material that we're to cover in this class, and this is a review session. So I am only here to answer your questions that have been submitted. I have one question or comment that was submitted that I'll raise about parameterizations. But other than that, I'm just going to keep an open camera here. And as people check in or ask additional questions, then I'll address them. I will also keep account of the time so that if you're scrubbing through this later and there's not any questions or content, you know what happened during the session. Okay, so good exam three, release due, homework from 6.8 due. One more thing I'll address in our warm up here is remember in your Google Drive folders, you have all of your graded papers and grade reports. I cannot keep those graded papers indefinitely in those folders. I have to turn around those folders. So What's gonna happen is you hand in the exam on December 18. I have to hand in grades on the Tuesday following that. And I will send you, I will put in your Google Drive folder, your graded exam and your final grade report when I submit the grades. So when you receive, and then I'll send an email saying that those things are uploaded. After I send that email, which will be sometime during the day on Tuesday, probably in the afternoon or evening. From that time, I'm gonna give you seven days to clear out that folder. You could clear out that folder now. You can't delete files from the folder, but you can download all the files in the folder, keep them for your records. And seven days after I release the grades, seven days after I tell you the grades are posted, I will delete those folders and contents. So after that, you won't have access to them. So grades are due on Tuesday. Let's count forward Sunday the 19th, Monday the 20th, Tuesday the 21st. And your folders will be emptied seven days after that.
so I'm just trying to give you notice of that. You may have already downloaded papers and stored them yourself, but I'm just going to tell you I can't keep those up permanently, of course. So make sure you download and file anything you'd like to keep. And I think you keep far too many electronic records, but maybe these electronic records are a little more valuable to you than some other records. Okay, let me think if there's anything else we want to release. You can still contact me by email this week and I'll answer questions as they come in. And you can contact me after the semester is over as well. And I will answer questions and notes in the order they arrive, maybe during the vacation, not as quickly as I ordinarily do. So let me address one question that's arisen about parameterizations. And then I will let it be unless I receive other questions by email or people checking in. Okay. And the idea here that I want to address is the concept that there's more than one way to parameterize something. Uh, let's look at a very simple case of parameterizing a bowl. Let's say you have the function z equals x squared plus y squared. I'm going to pick an example out of the book. But first, let me explain the purpose of the example. You can parameterize that bowl directly or indirectly. You could parameterize the bowl more than one way, maybe several ways. But the idea here is you have a elliptic paraboloid based at the origin in the xy plane. And you may be trying to calculate surface area, or you may be able to try to calculate a surface integral or flux through the surface, any number of things. And let's call this elliptic paraboloid S. In the most simple terms, you have the ability to parameterize that directly. I'm going to stay with my U and V generic parameters here. And you can say that this is X, Y, and X squared plus Y squared. Now, the value of that is the parameterization is relatively simple. But the cost is you have to describe where X and Y are. And you do that in the domain of the parameterization. The other natural choice right here is, sorry. OK, I said I was going to use U and V. I can use X and Y, but then one thing I can't do is mix the two. OK, so let's try it again. Okay, let me get that camera set right there. I am pinning and recording the right material. Okay, so let's try it again. We could say R of U and V, and you can use X and Y if you like, is U, V, and U squared plus V squared. This is a direct parameterization. But then we're gonna have to describe where U and V are, and U squared plus V squared will be this shadow cast by this bowl. U squared plus V squared is a disk, a solid disk of radius one. Now this has the advantage of having simple partial derivatives and cross product, but sooner or later you see that you're gonna have to go to polar coordinates most likely because this is going to be integrated most effectively with respect to circles. Let's call this parameterization one. 
and the other natural parameterization, parameterization two, is let u and v stand for radius and angle. So you could say u cosine v, u sine v, and I've made this a little bit too crowded to stay next to my picture, and x squared plus y squared would be u squared cos squared plus u squared sine squared, which collapses into u squared. Now, the advantage of this, you know, the disadvantage is your parameterization is a little more complicated. Your partial derivatives are going to be a little bit more work and maybe plugging into the integrals a little bit more work, but the advantage is the constant limit. Here you can describe this. And we're saying z is between 0 and 1 in this parameterization. I'm only taking part of that ball. I could describe the radius as being between 0 and 1. And the angle, the parameter v representing angle, between 0 and 2 pi. So what I wanted to point out, and because people have used both styles of parameterizations, is that one is not better than the other. One of them has a setup on the front end. One of them has a setup on the back end. Sometimes it's good to begin direct. But sooner or later, if you have any kind of polar or circular symmetry or spherical symmetry in the spherical case, you're going to make a change to polar, cylindrical, or spherical coordinates in the integral anyway. So in the case of S1, we like this parameterization because partial r partial u and partial r partial v are easy to calculate. Partial r partial u, 1, 0, and 2u. Partial r partial v, 0, 1, and 2v. And that makes cross product when I'm working on the ds partial u partial r partial u cross partial r partial v a little bit simpler looking minus 2u minus 2v and 1 notice that this is upward pointing because the z coordinate is fixed to be 1 Notice in this parameterization also that the z coordinate has a fixed length and the x and y coordinates are varying. Let me pull out a different color or two. The other parameterization. I don't want you to shy away from it because it looks messier. But you could easily say, I'll set up the straight ahead parameterization and then I'll switch to polar coordinates. You have the option, what you feel more comfortable with. Partial R, partial U, cosine V, sine V, and 2U, partial R, partial V, minus u sine v, u cos v, and zero. And then partial r, partial u cross partial r, partial v. Excuse me. Is equal to negative two u squared cos v, negative 2u squared sine v, because essentially I'm taking the cross product, I'm taking the determinant from the other side first. And then the last term collapses, u cos squared plus u sine squared, give me a straight u. Now here, notice the z coordinate is still positive this is also an upward directed normal, but the z coordinate is not constant. 
So you can use either of these parameterizations. And often, your choice might be dependent on what you're doing or on the qualities. Let me number this paper, or the qualities or the complexity of the problem. So I thought I would illustrate this with an example. So one is not better or worse than the other. I tend to use trigonometric representations. I tend to set things up in polar coordinates from the very beginning or cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates from the very beginning when I can for two reasons. I like referring to the constant limits. It focuses my attention on the integral, makes some integrals easier to look at. And I like to observe the way the sines and cosines work together, collapse, or work towards zero net contributions in some areas. So reading your papers most recently, you have been a little bit wiser about evaluating complicated integrals and identifying places where the contributions naturally zero out. That shortens your work considerably. Let me see if I can pick an ordinary example from this. And the first thing that comes to my mind would probably be in section 6.6, six, because that's where you first played with. Surface integrals. I'm looking at some hemispherical problems right here. I'm looking at that. Yeah, if I talk about a hemisphere, then I can go rectangular, cylindrical, or spherical. So you choose based on what seems most effective to you in a given problem. I'm trying to find something here that would illustrate things nicely. Let's just look at 282. Because I have a suspicion how that's going to come out. And it's not too complicated to use as an illustration. It's a good first illustration. So the question says, let S be the hemisphere, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is equal to four. Z is greater than or equal to zero. And they want you to evaluate the surface integral over S, X minus two Y DS. Instructions are a little bit odd here. Evaluate each surface integral in the counterclockwise direction, but you're not following a direction and you're not computing a flux here either. So I am not crazy about the way that was stated, but let's look at this expression right here. First, let me draw the hemisphere and see if there's anything I can gain from looking at that. So this is a sphere of radius two, but only the upper half. Draw something that looks approximately like a circle. Bring it 
out here along the x-axis as well. Give it a fair circular base and maybe make one or two circular cross-section scratches. And then you have this hemisphere. Now it's okay to speculate on the value of this integral. And what I'm interested in right here is the linear nature of this term, you know, x to the first and y to the first. And as I look, half of this object is symmetrically placed about the x-axis. Half of this object is symmetrically placed about the y-axis. And I'm gonna be adding up contributions of this function over this hemisphere, over this gumdrop. Now, I wouldn't be surprised, although I'll make no commitments, maybe every contribution when X is positive is met by an equal contribution on the other side when X is negative. But you could say the same thing about Y. Any contribution based over here at Y be matched by a contribution based on the other side of the y axis as well. So don't bother or don't uh, don't mind looking for symmetry in a problem where it might exist. Okay. Now we got to choose a parameterization. We could go straight ahead with our parameterization and then switch to polar or spherical coordinates. Or we could go directly to spherical coordinates with our parameterization. You could also represent this in terms of cylindrical coordinates, you know, based on the circle and going up a certain height. The rectangular coordinates are going to involve some square roots. The spherical coordinate is going to involve no square roots originally, but more crunching in the ds. The cylindrical coordinates will involve some square roots in the description of the height, kind of halfway between the two. I think I'm going to go straight to spherical. Because I think that when I evaluate this thing as an integral anyway in the future, I'm going to use spherical coordinates, spherical coordinates to describe the limits. So this is my own bias, but maybe we'll do the rectangular one in a second. So remember, you got rectangular coordinates, then you got polar coordinates, and then you got spherical coordinates, x replaced by r cosine theta, and then r replaced by rho sine phi. and z replaced by rho cos phi. So this is how you use the two famous triangles to track your coordinate transformations. The two famous triangles I'm talking about are the triangle and the plane that relates x, y, and r and the triangle, the right triangle standing up, that relates R, Z, phi, and rho. Okay, so let's write this in terms of spherical coordinates. I'm gonna use my generic parameters U and V, just because, I mean, I could definitely describe this with a fixed row of two and I could say r is a function of phi and theta, but I'm just going to use u and v generic because I always write parameterizations with generic variables. Again, that's personal bias. So rho is definitely equal to two. I usually describe the theta with v and the phi. I'll let that be u here. So I say two sine u, cosine v, 
two. I gotta make sure my lights don't turn off. Hang on a second. Sign you, sign V, and two, cosine U. And I'm gonna run that. If you name the letters differently, make sure you assign the right values to how you're running those. So the U representing the phi goes from zero north to pi over two, the plane. It's the angle from the vertical, from zero to pi over two. And the V, which is representing the theta, is going all the way around the Z axis, full revolution, zero to two pi. Okay, so here's the price I pay for preloading this in spherical coordinates. I have to calculate these partials and this cross product. But it is just doing that. It's pre-working the integral so that I get an easier integral possibly in the end, or I get to evaluate more directly possibly in the end. So with respect to u, I have two cos u cos v, two cos u sine v, and minus two sine u with respect to v, I have minus two sine u sine v with respect to v, minus two sine u cos v and with respect to v, zero in this slot. Now we execute the cross product. Oh, excuse me. I need to number this. And move forward. And so in the first slot, I have zero, and then I have Subtracting this positive result for sine squared u cosine v, it'll earn a minus sign. In the middle slot, I would take the determinant and then take the opposite of that. I'm sometimes in the habit of just taking the determinant backwards. Four sine squared u sine v and zero. And in the third slot, I get a little bit of collapsing because I get minus two sine u cos u with a cos squared v. And then I get plus two sine u cos u with a sine squared v. Now I'm a little bit nervous about that because I wanted to see those things work together to collapse the cos squared v plus sine squared v is equal to zero. So they're not collapsing. This is a negative and this is subtracting the negative that's a positive. So something is odd about my writing here. I've lost the minus sign. So keep track of what you're doing as you go along. We recheck from the top here. This parameterization is correctly written according to the spherical transformation. Let's make sure I kept my minus signs carefully here. This derivative with respect to u is sine u becomes cosine u, sine u becomes cosine u, and cosine u becomes minus sine u. That's good. Must have one of these negatives off right here. So what I have right here is, we see it, the cosine v becomes minus sine v, but the sine v becomes cosine v, not minus cosine v. So two sine u sine v differentiates this two sine u cos v. This is a positive sign. And then let's go back and fix this. In the first slot, I have zero 
minus the negative. This makes this positive. In the second slot, I have negative, negative, minus zero. That makes this positive. In the last slot, I have positive four sine u cos u with a cos squared v and positive four sine u cos u with a sine squared v. That becomes positive four sine u cos u. Okay, better. And now I'm gonna get some more collapsing because when I take the magnitude of this, square each piece, add and square root. I'm also gonna get some sine squared cosine squared action, particularly when I square the first two pieces. The 16 sine fourth u cos squared v plus 16 sine fourth u sine squared v. I'll combine those right now. So this is 16 sine fourth u. And this is 16, collapsing's not done sine squared u, cos squared u. Now remember this was a sine u, cos u, and sine u, cos u, there's no v in this term. So this is equal to one. And now right here, as I take the square root, I get a copy of 16 sine squared u that I get to remove. 16 sine fourth u. Let's get my letters going on right here. Sorry, 16 sine squared u that I get to remove. And then what's left behind is a sine squared u plus a cosine squared u. Which equals one again. So notice how this turns out to be four sine u. Now, in the old days, we called this the price of doing the spherical coordinate transformation. Remember that was rho squared sine phi? So notice how this turns out to be the rho squared. This is the two squared. This is the sine u, which was the sine phi. If you're used to doing the spherical transformation, you could use this to your advantage and you avoided this work right here. I just wanted you to see the transformation happening. But do that very carefully if you're going to take that shortcut. So now we can set up this integral, integral of x minus 2y over the surface s with respect to s. So we use the r limits which were in u and v, we replace x and minus 2y, we replace the x and y here with 2 sine u cosine v minus 2 times y, which was 2 sine u sine v, that's minus 4 sine u sine v, and then we have to use the ds, which was the magnitude of this cross product, four sine u times the area element with respect to u and v. So written out as an integral, zero to two pi, that's the dv, zero to pi over two, remember this is only hemisphere, that's the du, remember u represented five, v represented theta. And now let's combine this is eight sine squared u cos v, and here is minus 16 sine squared u sine v. And this is a little bit better than I hoped. Sorry, I'll bring that up here. 
because what this is going to demonstrate is a very direct substitution and a zeroing out. So let's look at this expression right here. Uh, oh no, it's zeroing out in both terms, isn't it? So your your eyes are focused on the sine squared in both cases, like you know, oh power of sine. What am I going to do with that? But let's look at the cosine v and sine v. That's the zeroing out that I expected, front and back on the x-axis, front and back on the y-axis, because when I integrate with respect to v, and remember v is going over the full zero to two pi, this is gonna be no net contribution, no net contribution, because I'm doing a full cosine wave and a full sine wave. I'm not saying that these terms are zeros when I use that notation. I'm saying that that chunk will contribute zero to the integral, near zero net value to the integral. And you say, well, but you gotta, the, it says you have to integrate with respect to u first, but these are constant limits, constant limits I can switch as I wish, constant finite limits. So let's do the integral with respect to v first. Let's consider the eight sine squared u and this minus 16 sine squared u to be constants. And I'm just evaluating zero to two pi cos v, zero to two pi sine v. Those are the zeros. And so now I'm even done. So there's a price to pay at the beginning of this because of the parameterization. But the expression of the integral in the sines and cosines made it more clear what terms are going to be zeroed out. Now, I also want to point out that in Mathematica, you could do this rectangular coordinates, or you could do this in rectangular coordinates, spherical coordinates in Mathematica. You can verify this calculation either way. So I'm going to pull up Mathematica to look at this. But I like setting up the integral in terms of sines and cosines, particularly when I have symmetry, because it identifies quickly which portions are being zero to net contribution, no net contribution. So I'm going to pull up a Mathematica worksheet. Uh, let me make sure this is reset so I don't have any other variables interfering. And then I'll just execute these two integrals, rectangular and spherical. So I got my Mathematica open. I got a new document right here. Let me enlarge this and then I'll share this sheet with you. And let's try, excuse me. First of all, verify what I just did in the spherical coordinates. Integrate, integrate. I put in the carriage returns here just for readability. So I have eight sine u squared. I have to enter that like this, minus 16, oh, times the cosine of v. Let's do a little cut and paste, copy, 16 sine squared u sine v. And let's integrate that with respect to u first. And then with respect to v.
Well, let's see if I got all my commas and everything in order. Just to save trouble of fixing everything. Looks good. Let's try it out. There's my zero. And notice if I switch the limits of integration, that does not change the result. So constant limits of integration have this advantage that I can integrate in either order immediately. Okay, let's try this, but let's modify it. I'll keep this on the board. Let's modify it so that it is in rectangular form. Now there, I'm just going to integrate x minus 2y. So that looks appealing. But I have to integrate this with respect to the base of the hemisphere, which is a circle. I'm going to let x run from minus 2 to 2. And then for y, those will be my outer limits. And for every x, I select a y. And the y is going to be the square root of 4 minus x squared plus n minus. So let me get these typed in here. And then we'll check it. And then we'll evaluate the integral. So plus and minus. And so when x is 0, this is going to run from minus 2 to plus 2. When x is 2, this is going to run from minus 0 to plus 0. I think we're OK on this. This describes my circle. And this was not a messy situation. So Mathematica executed this pretty quickly. If you write a triple integral in rectangular coordinates and you don't have a lot of symmetry involved, it takes more time to evaluate this. I could switch the limits here. But notice I switched the limits. I have to change names of the variables in the inner limit. So, uh, excuse me, I don't need to do it like that. If I change this to a y from minus 2 to 2, then I have to describe x with respect to square root of 4 minus y squared plus and minus. So switching limits right there is perfectly legal, but I have to change exact, specifically what the limits look like, but also get the value zero. So interesting would be what happens if this was not symmetry? That would be if I had a two in here, let's say x minus two y squared. And then without symmetry, does this slow Mathematica down a little bit? It's not impossible, but it does slow Mathematica down just a little bit. Now, what would correspond to squaring y in this integral right here? Go back to my paper very quickly. So this was the minus 2y coordinate right here. So if I made this minus 2y squared, I would have minus 2 times y squared, which is 4 sine squared sine squared v. So this would be minus 8 sine squared sine squared v right here, and then multiplied by 4 sine squared uh, sine v. So it'd be minus 32 sine cubed sine squared v. So I'll put this in here, minus 32. Let me straighten that out. Sine cubed, sine squared, V. Uh, let me make sure I'm doing that correctly on the paper very quickly, because I want to show you how that integral collapses. So if I had minus two sine squared u, I'm still recording. Oh, uh, I'm on the paper right here, but I'll go back to the Mathematica worksheet in a second. So if I have x minus two y squared, 
then I have two sine u cosine v minus two times four minus two times four is minus eight sine squared u sine squared v. And remember, I also had the term from the cross product, which mounts from the Jacobian here. So I have eight sine squared u cosine v minus 32 sine squared u sine, uh, sine cubed u sine squared v. Now that's my integral. What kind of collapsing happens here? Same limit, zero to two pi. So do I get any breaks right here? I still have the cosine v running from zero to two pi. So I can simplify my writing by eliminating that. Zero to two pi, zero to pi over two, and just evaluate the minus 32 sine cubed u sine squared v du dv. But it looks like I'm out of luck for a shortcut right here, but not the case. Remember sine squared v is half minus half cosine of 2v. It's a double angle formula, really useful in substitutions uh, and integration. So what I have right here is the contribution of a half and then the contribution of a cosine 2v from zero to pi over two. Now let's check this out. Normally cosine looks like this, and that is zero to two pi. But now 2v, give me a period of pi, and then from zero to pi over two, what's the net area under that? From zero to pi over two, the net area under cosine 2v is zero. So this term is gonna contribute nothing. So let me rewrite that carefully so you can look at it. This shows you some of the value of working with sines and cosines. Sine cubed u, and this is half minus half cosine 2v, du dv. I can switch the order of integration so that I do the v integration first, because these are constant limits. So there's no cost to switching the order of integration, no rewriting of the, or, uh, of the limits. So I imagine that I've switched these and this contribution is net zero contribution. That leaves only this. So I'm gonna do zero to two pi. So now I've reduced my integral in size further, zero to pi over two minus 16 sine cubed u du dv. And remember that was integrating, oh, okay, be careful. I was integrating with respect to v here. I didn't have to pull out the pi over two. I didn't have to use the pi over two. The pi over two belonged to you. But if I integrate this factor over two pi, which would be, two full waves of cosine. Excuse me, that still gives me a net zero area contribution. Okay, so I spoke uncautiously right there. This contribution is zero, but over the full zero to two pi. Okay, so now I'm evaluating this integral right here. And notice I have minus, I have zero to two pi, integrate with respect to v, no v's in here. So that's just gonna be two pi, zero to pi over two. 
and pull out the minus 16. And now I'm going to integrate 0 to pi over 2 sine cubed u du. But that can be handled with uh, rearrangement. Let's break sine squared u into what? Uh, sine cubed u into sine squared u sine u. And this is 1 minus cos squared u sine u. Let me move this paper a bit. You can already tell from the thing we did in Mathematica, this integral must turn out to be 1, because our answer was minus 32 pi a second ago. 0 to pi over 2 u. And this, let's let u be cosine. Uh, let's let w, I guess we need to use a different lane, be cosine u. So dw is minus sine u du. So this is minus dw. And this is 1 minus w squared. And we integrate this w minus w cubed over 3. And we put back the w cosine. Oh, and I'll take a minus sign through there. So minus w plus w cubed over 3. And I'll get minus cosine u plus one third cosine cubed u. Evaluate that from zero to pi over two. This doesn't look immediately promising, but remember the cosine of pi over two is zero. So this contribution from that would be zero negative plus one third zero cubed. Contribution of zero is minus cosine of zero be negative one plus one third, and I'm going to subtract that. So this is negative two thirds times negative. This will be two thirds. So I should have negative 16, two pi, and two thirds here. So negative 32 pi times two over three negative 64 pi over three when I execute that. Uh, somehow I've lost a factor. I wasn't expecting that two thirds right there. So let's go back to the Mathematica worksheet and try that out. We said what would happen if we wrote the eight pi or the eight sine squared u cosine v minus 32 sine cubed u sine squared v. And from this expression, we were expecting a minus eight pi, excuse me, when I did that. That's interesting here. So I haven't accounted for something, right? I get the minus 64 pi over three as I wanted on my paper, but why don't I get the same result here? because this should also be x minus 2y squared. So what are we missing between those two? And you may already see this right now, and I'm blind to it. It doesn't matter whether I switch this order. I have to get the same value there. But why is this x minus 2y squared? And this is not x minus 2y squared. Uh, dun -dum 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 -dum. Here's my u from pi over 2. Here's my v from 0 to 2 pi. The order does not make any difference right here. I'm glad that I got the minus 64 pi over 3 because that justifies what we put on the paper. But immediately, I'm nervous that these are not the same. So the y squared was 
four sine squared u sine v. And then that got multiplied by a minus two. So minus eight sine squared u sine v. And then it got multiplied by a four sine u. So minus 32 sine squared u times sine u sine cubed u sine squared v. Okay, so I don't see any issues right there. And this expression, the eight sine u cos v was the two sine u sine v times the four sine u squared. I should be evaluating to the same number in both of these if they represent the same integral. So somewhere here, this is not an appropriate representation. I'll let you tell me what the difference between these two is. Okay. So just illustrating different parameterizations and the symmetry and time-saving features of using the parameterizations with sines and cosines. There's my 64 pi over three. Okay, I'll let it rest here because that was the only question that I received. You know, what's the difference between choosing this parameterization and that parameterization? Uh, I am still gonna sit up here. We're at break time right now, but when we come back from the break, I'll count off time for you. But if there's nobody else submitting questions, that's all we're going to do. And maybe this first hour was useful to you. So let's come back at 9.07. If I can find exactly where I've misstepped in that Mathematica notebook, I'll also post it here when we come back. I'm going to stretch my legs and take a break for a few minutes, and then we'll come back. And you are invited to do the same.
Okay, welcome back. So, uh, just in case you're scrubbing through this video later, and in case someone checks in later, I'm going to keep the time here, but that was the only question I received. I'll scan through the work we just did to make sure I try to identify the place where I change the value of that rectangular integral. But other than that, I'm not going to add anything to it here. And I'll just mark time as we go along till the end of the period. If you have any questions, make sure to send me an email while you're working on your exam, and I'll help you out in so far as I am able. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute while I'm waiting here until someone pops in or until I want to bring that rectangular issue to resolution.
Okay, let me break in with how to fix this situation. And I'll let you make these adjustments. But my error was, even if I go straight ahead with x minus two y squared, I believe more strongly in this minus 64 pi over three, and you can verify that. But even if I go ahead with this x minus two y squared, this directness, I still have to parameterize. So I have to parameterize the sphere and then work out the partial derivatives, the cross product and the magnitude, which gets to be in a relatively mellow place. But now the issue is gonna be as u squared minus v squared approaches four, as I approach the boundary of the circle, I'm looking at technically an improper integral here, which is something the sines and cosines resolve behind the scenes. So this has got to be the integral that we send to evaluate. And if we send that integral to evaluate Mathematica, I get a rather abstract answer because Mathematica makes assumptions about the qualities of u and v. So you can pursue this path, go check this. My belief is that this is gonna come out to be minus 64 pi over three, but this is gonna be a good exercise for you. So going direct here does not get me out of any ugly cross product work necessarily. And that's another reason why uh, I have this habit of going to the polar, the circular, the spherical presentations directly whenever they're available. Okay, I'll still hang out here for a few more minutes and mark the time, but uh, best of luck, best wishes in your next semester. And send me a note if you have any questions.
I'm just going to cut in here and share this Mathematica screen with you if you want to verify this yourself. Here's the so here's the parameterization with the spherical coordinates. And then here's the straight ahead with the correct DS in here. And you get the minus 64 pi over 3 both ways. So I just wanted to make sure everybody saw that. Okay, you guys have a good day.